Uh, as you know, Heather, you've been involved in uh, reviewing very thoroughly our patient information booklets. So these patient information booklets are produced in collaboration with patients and carers uh, for every single step of the bladder cancer journey. Uh, what are your thoughts, Heather, on these booklets? Um, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted that, that these have been produced, to be honest. Um, I think it's been something that we've been needing for, for quite a long time. Um, the, the information that's already out there um, is, is limited um, and is quite hefty in, in booklets that cover a lot of things at once. It's very difficult to know when in the patient's journey to, to give them a booklet. Um, for example, if somebody's coming in with a suspected bladder cancer, you don't, you don't know what kind of bladder cancer it's going to be, so you don't know which booklet to give them. So you don't want to give them a booklet that's going to have loads of wrong information or inappropriate information. So often those patients don't get a book, any book, until they've actually been diagnosed. But actually, you know, they have those questions and those anxieties at the beginning. So with these booklets, the way they're broken down, there's, there's a book for every stage. So um, at every point, the patient can come, go away with something in written format as well to, to look at, which I think is really important, although we, we all just try and explain to the patients and, and describe what's going to happen and what the next plan is. Um, it's, it's very difficult um, for patients to take all that information in, I think. For more information about fight bladder cancer, you can visit this link or you can scan this barcode with your smartphone camera. Well, good morning and welcome to this session on controversies in bladder cancer. Uh, I'm Jo Cresswell and I'm a consultant urologist in Middlesbrough. I'm also vice president of BAS. Uh, I'll be giving a short talk about bladder cancer pathways. And then I'm delighted to say that we have uh, Professor Jim Catto, who's going to talk to us about clinical trials in bladder cancer, many of which are highly relevant to our bladder cancer pathways and also Professor Rick Bryan, who's gonna talk about uh, translational research, and in particular, those aspects that are relevant to us as general urologists and are likely to come into play in the next few years. Okay. Well, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about my favorite subject of bladder cancer. The title of my talk is The Ideal versus the real world cancer pathway. Um, I think it's fair to say that perhaps ideal is a strong word, perhaps what we aspire to versus what we're achieving. So I think we're all fairly familiar with the uh, cancer pathways that we've had in place for many years now. Uh, the two week rule pathway, we need to see the patient within two weeks of referral. Then when we make a decision about treatment, we have 31 days to deliver that treatment. Overall, the pathway uh, allows 62 days from referral to treatment. And how are we doing on that pathway in urology? Well, it's a bit of a mixed picture, really. If you look at these graphs, uh, 2018, 2019, we were doing reasonably well with seeing patients within two weeks. Uh, we were doing reasonably well with seeing patients uh, get treated within 31 days of decision to treat. We were doing fairly poorly, unfortunately, with the 62 day target. And if you look, um, the orange line is actually for urological cancers. And there are certainly other cancer specialties that are doing better than we are. Breast is a notable one. Clearly 2020 has been an extraordinary year and we've drifted even further for uh, reasons that are beyond our control. So why is it that we can hit the two week target and the 31 day target mostly? but not the 62 day. Well, I think the problem is this gap here. This is the diagnostic delay. So uh, say for bladder cancer, this is cystoscopy and imaging. Um, it may well be histology uh, in the new cancer waiting time targets. So although we're seeing the patients quickly, we're having quite a long delay between that and then getting them treated. Now, we don't hit the target uh, for most urological cancers. And the target, I'm sure you'll agree, is not that ambitious really. But even worse, we actually disadvantage our uh, 
most aggressive disease, in other words, muscle invasive bladder cancer. So we fail the target and we particularly fail this group of patients. This is highlighted by our GERFT report in 2018, which actually showed that the median time uh, from referral to cystectomy was 144 days. That's median, that's not maximum. That's way over three months. I don't think it's any consolation that our oncology colleagues are similarly struggling to deliver radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And it's a global problem. If you look at different countries, this is TURBT to radical cystectomy. So this is actually already including many, many days of diagnosis and waiting for treatment. And you can see that many uh, major healthcare systems are also struggling. And we know it impacts survival. We actually have good data to show that if you delay radical cystectomy for more than three months, more people die of bladder cancer. Well, that's why it's a strong recommendation from the EAU recommendations that it should take place within three months. So one of the reasons for this is to do with the way our regulatory pathways and guidance is set up. It's set up for all cancers, and we know that one size does not fit all. If you look at the pathway here, for example, for prostate cancer, it works reasonably well. It's reasonably feasible to deliver a radical prostatectomy within 62 days of referral. That's because our urologists and our radiologists have done a tremendous job in work on this pathway. Uh, but actually, some people would argue this is a bit quick if you have a low to intermediate risk prostate cancer. If you look at bladder cancer, if you've got a low risk bladder cancer, again, 62 days is not that demanding, is it, to resect a solitary low grade tumour. But if you have a particularly aggressive and nasty bladder cancer, this is where we really struggle. If you have your TURBT at 62 days, which ticks the box for the cancer pathway, and you've got muscle invasive disease, then we've got a heck of a lot to do for you. And we've already missed two months of that treatment time. So it's a triple challenge in my view. First of all, regulatory change to encourage a level playing field for bladder cancer pathway change, and then at the coalface, what we all do each day. So regulatory change, and this has been lobbied for, for many years, decades probably, all of the groups there, oncologists, patients and BAUS have been lobbying that TURBT should not count as a definitive treatment for bladder cancer. And the new National Cancer Waiting Times Guidance version 10 has changed. It is no longer a first definitive treatment unless the tumour is effectively removed or treated, which is essentially your low risk disease only. Now this actually came into force on the 1st of April 2020, but I'll wager a lot of us overlooked it because for various reasons, I think we were looking the other way. But this is now, in fact, the guidance that we should be working to and our cancer trackers are working to. It's a very challenging timeline to implement, Another part of this new cancer waiting time guidance is that we need to give the patient a diagnosis within 28 days of referral. And this includes the histology, histology of TURBT or of any other biopsy. Then we have a further 34 days to start definitive treatment. That hits the 62 day target. So for example, if you're having a radical cystectomy to get your operation or to start your first dose of neoadjuvant. A little bit of a grey area around intracycle treatment, but I would suggest it works best for patients if we say that 62 days to the first dose of an adjuvant intracycle course. Now, in terms of delivering it in practice, I think one opportunity is to use the language of prostate cancer that everyone is familiar with, our cancer trackers and our management are familiar with. So if you have a low risk bladder cancer, it's resected with a TURBT, and then you don't need anything other than active surveillance, so your clock stops. If it's a higher risk cancer, you have your TURBT, and you go on to have adjuvant treatment. The clock can stop at the first dose. And if you have muscle invasive bladder cancer, you have your TURBT, which is effectively a biopsy, and go on to your radical treatment. I think we should consider TURBT as a transurethral biopsy of bladder tumour, of course, as urologists, we know we need to completely remove it for many patients, 
but think of it as a biopsy for many pathways. This requires process innovation, new technologies. Jim Catto and Rick Bryan will talk about this and hopefully we can apply those to the advantage of patients. We need new ways of working and we need new ways of thinking. We need to do things differently. Our regulators have agreed with our principle that TURBT is not definitive treatment. They've given us challenging new targets, but this means that resources can be more evenly applied and bladder cancer uh, gets a level playing field in the world of urological cancer. However, to get a chap like this from hematuria clinic to radical cystectomy is an enormous task, a mountain to climb, it requires all of our skills, including our communication, our multidisciplinary team working and real drive from every member of the team to get this patient through. It's a challenge. It's going to be difficult and particularly difficult in the world we're living in at the moment. However, for our patients, they can only serve to be advantaged by this. And it, we drive down that 144 days, then we're doing an enormous amount of good for these patients. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. And I'd like to thank uh, the BAUS uh, committees for inviting me to give this uh, interesting talk. This is a really interesting session with Joe and Rick. Uh, I have a few conflicts of interest that uh, I show here, mostly to do with research funding and uh, consultancy. Um, the first talk I want to talk about, the first focus today is about imaging. So many of you will know about VIRADS, so using MRI as opposed to TRBT to stage disease with a view to trying to accelerate the care pathway for people invasive cancer. Uh, this, uh, over the last 12 months, have been various uh, external validations of VIRADS. Generally, they're very, very encouraging if you use a VIRADS score of three to select muscle invasive disease, but they're all uh, single center, retrospective, various biases. So to look forward and to try and test this, we're currently part of uh, the NIHR bladder path study being run by Nick James. Uh, and this is the update of this so far. So we've now had 96 people who've been randomized to either standard of care. So to remind you, these are people who we feel have high grade disease uh, on flexible cystoscopy. And at that point, they're randomized to either standard of care, which is TRBT or image guided care, which would be uh, MRI. And if it was invasive to go straight to radical treatment. What we're seeing so far is that flexible cystoscopy is pretty good at picking out non-invasive disease. MRI is quite good at picking out non-invasive disease, but it has mixed results with regards to muscle invasive disease. Uh, this study is not powered around MRI diagnostics, it's powered around time to radical treatment. And we are certainly seeing faster pathways on the MRI directed care. This is an outline and Rick has a poster, I believe at this BAUS and an update at the EAU. Uh, with regards to patient reported outcomes, uh, we know that uh, there are three things that patients care about, survival, quality of survival and quality of care. Uh, we've just completed a large uh, quality of survival PROM study, uh, which is run throughout Yorkshire. So some of you will have seen me present this at Baus Oncology in the past. So this is Lab P BC. This was, uh, there's two components and we've just finished the cross-sectional survey. So this was patients who had a uh, diagnosis and treatment of bladder cancer up to 10 years ago. And we have just under 2000 who've responded. And there you can see a mixture of those who've had just a simple TRBT. TRBT with chemo or BCG, cystectomy, cystectomy with other treatments, which some of them included radiotherapy and salvage cystectomy, and then radical radiotherapy alone. Uh, we had about four or five major findings from this study. So as I say, this is uh, 1,800 patients. The first one is that the overall quality of life, so the activities of daily living, holidays, uh, mobility, usual care, pain, discomfort, is not affected by the treatment you've received. So up to 10 years after surgery, uh, whether you've had a TRBT, cystectomy or therapy, your overall quality of life is dictated more by your age and your fitness rather than the actual treatment you've received. And that, that's important because many of us will have a number of scenarios whereby we're balancing what we feel is optimal cancer care with more impactful treatment. So we find that the overall quality of life is dictated more by the patient status than by the treatment they received. The next thing that mattered was sex. Uh, men had low function and lots of problems with sex. Women generally 
avoided answering that question. And I think that's important because most of us who do, do radical prostatectomy spend a lot of time on sexual counselling, but in the cystectomy population, we spend relatively little time looking at sexual function. And perhaps this is something we need to address more. As you'd expect, the rates are higher uh, in the cystectomy cohort than in the TRBT cohort, but are still substantial and are something that we probably are not addressing particularly well. Uh, financial matters also uh, are important. So younger people, people under 65, uh, up to 30% of those who'd had a cystectomy had said they had significant financial difficulties as, as a result of their treatment, and up to 20% with TR repeated TRBT. And that's not a surprise given the longevity, duration of treatment, and the impact on having to take time off work. So again, this is something that we probably need to work with our CNSs on to try and address ways to encourage support, uh, make awareness about different financial programs out there, and to lobby social services to give more support to these patients. Uh, and then our final take home message is that we were able to compare quality of life uh, with prostate, prostate patients and colorectal patients. And we saw that the bladder cancer population, whether male or female, had lower quality of life than uh, those other cancers. And again, that's important. That does not surprise us. Many of us who work in busy clinics are aware that there aren't enough nurses, there aren't enough supporting services out there. And I think this kind of feeds back into all of that. So again, important for legislators and our commissioners. Um, Proms are important, and uh, Para Mariapam in Scotland has been leading uh, the, an NHS Scotland initiative to bolt uh, quality metrics and quality performance indicators into Scottish care. He published the first series of these in European Neurology this year, where they looked at the non-must invasive pathway, and they looked at uh, ways you could improve the quality uh, metrics. And so, for example, uh, we see in the first graph there that the use of a bladder di diagram, so accurately, accurately drawing where and how you check the bladder uh, increase incrementally from year one to year three. Uh, other, other measures did not improve particularly because they were doing very well. So detrusor muscle rates and post-optive mitomycin C rates didn't improve particularly well. Uh, but then uh, recurrence at first testosterone and residual tumor, we saw some improvements. We also saw differences between volume centers. And that's important because you need to equalize uh, patient experience. So if you look at the recurrence at first cystoscopy, the rates vary from low to high centers and according to whether it's a trainee or a consultant. So in a uh, low volume center, the trainee actually had better results than a high volume uh, than, a, than a consultant in the same service. Although obviously that, that may reflect selection. Uh, the importance of this is this is the beginning of quality performance metrics across the board and having completed work package one, uh, NHS Scotland and Param are now looking through work package two and three, which will include PROMS and hopefully some translational work to try and sort of uh, come up with external measures, very much like the National Prostate Cancer Audit has done in prostate cancer. Um, the next uh, study talked through is BRAVO. So this was a study that we've just uh, had accepted for publication. This was a feasibility where we randomized patients between radical cystectomy and uh, BCG immunotherapy. So patients with uh, high grade non muscle invasive bladder cancer with high risk features uh, were prospectively approached and randomized. We approached uh, 400, we screened 407, we approached 215, and in the end, we got 51 who consented and 50 who eventually were randomized and had treatment. Uh, difficult study, this was a feasibility and it won't be taken forward into large phase three because of the difficulty in the question and recruitment. But we did find lots of things that were important. So of the 50 that were randomized to BCG, 23 had BCG, 22 had maintenance completed. We saw low grade and high grade uh, recurrence in two and two induction, uh, low grade, high grade in one and two at four months. And at the end of the series, uh, of the 25 who had BCG, four had a cystectomy, two for initial choice and two because they had disease progression and recurrence. And by the end of follow-up, two of the 23 had got met metastatic disease, so just under 10%. In the cystectomy population, uh, 20 out of the 25 accepted cystectomy, so five uh, declined and although they randomized to it, it opted for BCG. 17 had uh, a conduit three in near bladder. Uh, and at the end of the, all of that, the histology, we had 13 patients with non-muscle invasive disease, two with muscle invasive disease, so 10%, and we had various prostate cancers in 25% uh, um, of, of the patients. Uh, there was no uh, long-term uh, recurrence from bladder cancer as a consequence of that. Of those two people who've got muscle invasive disease, we should note that um, 
uh, they'd all undergone re-resection and CT scanning as prior uh, typical uh, MDT care. So uh, both these features suggest that about 10% of these population have got muscle invasive and aggressive disease, and perhaps they need radical and systemic treatment. Uh, one point to say, we're, we're near here completing IROC, which is open versus intracorporeal robotic cystectomy. We've now finished recruitment and we're now in the outcome collection phase. We had a trial meeting uh, in November last year, whereupon we looked at various features and one of which was complications. So this is the whole cohort, so not separated by arm, that'd be unethical to do so. And what you can see is that about 50% of the patients had no significant complications. Uh, we had grade three, uh, Clavin Dindo 3B and a, uh, plus and above was 7%. Uh, and uh, 72 patients had more than one complication. The length of the stay was seven days, which is very typical to the um, robotic population in BAUS, although better than the open population in BAUS. Uh, our data do favor, uh, compare, do, do look favorable compared to other series, and I think represents a, a good outcome from British urology. Uh, if we compare ourselves with the North American, so Memorial Sloan Kettering, for each of their complication rates, you can see here in blue, uh, the IROC data appear more favorable and probably suggest that centralized, centralized high volume care is a good out outcome for patients. I'm going to finish with two important studies that have just come out, both looking at neoadjuvant immunotherapy, so combining pdl one with CTLA-4 in vision prior to cystectomy, but the Nabucco study from the Netherlands where we had people with very high risk disease, uh, so T3, T4, hydronephrosis, uh, uh, extremely high risk, uh, possibly unresectable disease, who were cisplatin uh, ineligible, they underwent ipilimumab and nivolumab and then re-resection and then resection to a cystectomy. Uh, and they found that actually had uh, significant, uh, out significantly good outcomes. Most patients had their treatment within 12 weeks. Uh, there was 55% grade three to four immune rate of toxicity, uh, but we had 46% uh, complete response rates, uh, residual disease in 12%. So fantastic results compared to what was expected in this population. Uh, and then a similar study from uh, MD Anderson looked in cisplatin ineligible. In this population, they used Devalumab and Tremolumab, which are the same sort of molecules, but from AstraZeneca. Uh, we saw a various, various combination of side effects, but mostly they were all palatable, but we saw dramatic downstaging. So again, 37.5% uh, as opposed to 40% complete response rates in people with locally advanced high-risk disease. So both of these trials suggest that there's uh, significant uh, potential for neoadjuvant combined immunotherapy in this population. Uh, they, they found that some tertiary lymphoid structures were pr prognostic and potentially predictive. So I'd like to thank you and uh, look forward to an uh, interesting discussion and hope you all remain safe. Good afternoon. My name is Rick Bryan, the director of the Bladder Cancer Research Centre at the University of Birmingham. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank Duncan Summerton and Asif Munir, who originally invited me to deliver this talk at BAUS in Birmingham. And also thank you to Tim O'Brien and Asif for keeping me on the programme. And I am in Birmingham. And so, translational science for a general urologist, what's on the horizon? What might we see today and tomorrow? So there's quite a lot to get through and it's going to be quite fast paced. Um, anyway, let's start. These are my disclosures. So muscle invasive bladder cancer, I will only cover briefly. Uh, mainly because Jim will have talked about a lot of the trial activity already and also the majority of the burden of bladder cancer as a disease is to be found in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. As Jim would have outlined, there are a variety of drugs in trials in different settings from the neoadjuvant to advanced and metastatic disease. Those drugs include immuno-oncology agents, the FGFR inhibitor erdofitinib and the Nectin-4 targeter, targeter enfortumab vedotin. Uh, interestingly, the last couple of years has seen the uh, ongoing validation of 
tumor ERCC2 mutations as predictive to responses to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, as Jim has also mentioned, um, the bladder path trial is investigating whether MPMRI may be able to replace some TURBTs for tumors that visually appear to be muscle invasive. Uh, importantly, earlier this year uh, was published the consensus molecular classification of muscle invasive bladder cancer, defining six subtypes of the disease. These being luminal papillary, luminal non-specified, luminal unstable, stroma rich, basal or squamous, and neuroendocrine like. These tumours all have their own oncogenic mechanisms, their own distinct pathways, their own uh, patterns of mutations. But I suppose most importantly for the practicing urologist is each of these subtypes have a particular prognosis uh, with different outcomes being able to be defined for different subtypes. And they also have different responses to both conventional chemotherapeutic agents and immuno-oncology agents. And that is the subject of the GUSTO study being undertaken at the University of Sheffield and University of Southampton. And so whilst we've defined these subtypes for muscle invasive bladder cancer, we're also trying to move towards a consensus classification for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, perhaps actually a more complex endeavor. Uh, this work goes back to 2016 with the first uh, Uramol subtypes, three subtypes defined. That classification has, involved, has evolved with the addition of more tumors and more data and has evolved into four subtypes such that this is how the two classifications compare with each other. Earlier this year, very recently, we also had a proposal to subdivide T1 disease into five subtypes. Now, actually, this area of research is very active amongst my team here in Birmingham, and our data on 95 tumors would seem to suggest that three subtypes may be optimal. Here is just an illustration of the subtypes that we have developed in Birmingham. Uh, this is obviously a very complex slide, but in essence, it's the bottom two thirds to focus on. Each column represents an individual tumor and each row represents the expression of these genes defined here on the right. And our three subtypes are what we call mesenchymal, which align with uramol types 2A and 2B, basal, which align with uramol 2A, and luminal, which align with uramol 1 and 3. The majority of grade 3 T1 tumors are to be found within the mesenchymal and basal subtypes. And obviously these tumors are the most challenging to manage. So what does data like this, how do, how do data like this help us? Is this just an academic exercise or is there clinical relevance? Well, if we look at those G3 T1 tumors, we can see that those in the mesenchymal subtype have a bad outcome in 57% of cases, compared to only 25% of those G3 T1s in the basal subtype. And by bad outcome, I mean progression or bladder cancer death within three years of receiving at least six plus two doses of BCG. So clearly subtyping can help us manage more challenging tumors such as G3 T1s. It's also important to note that uh, within this worst group of tumors, we also find two or three G1 TA tumors. 
And we've known for several years that some low grade TA tumors do actually possess molecular characteristics that are more akin to muscle invasive disease. And these are the tumors that if followed up for long enough for 10 or 15 years, will eventually have demonstrated progression to muscle invasive disease. So aside from G3T1, subtyping may also allow us to continue the surveillance of patients with low grade TA tumors. As we understand more about the uh, uh, biomolecular alterations associated with bladder cancer, we move ever closer to non-invasive diagnosis. So urine tests for bladder cancer is actually becoming quite a crowded marketplace, particularly in the US with a number of tests listed there that have obtained FDA approval. In the UK, John Kelly has developed the Euromark urine test that relies on 150 methylation loci uh, 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 assessed by extracting urinary DNA. And also ourselves here in Birmingham, again, assess urinary DNA looking for 480 single nucleotide variants or individual mutations across 28 genes. Uh, so watch this space non-invasive diagnosis is coming soon. Um, again, there's been a lot of trials activity uh, stimulated by Big Pharma in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. We have new drugs in trials for both BCG naive and BCG refractory disease. These include immuno-oncology agents, Coxsackie virus A21, nadopharagene firadenovec, and the list goes on. We also have old drugs in new trials, intravesical combinations of gemcitabine and docetaxel as a BCG alternative, which is being used in the USA in particular. And we also have new drugs in development. We have a panel of epigenetic modulators that appear to demonstrate uh, great efficacy in a model that uh, recapitulates intravesical therapy. Some of those 10 promising agents are also in clinical trials in other cancer settings. We're also working with the University of Cardiff on a group of drugs known as propagens, which essentially stimulate a very profound gamma delta T cell response, which is to a certain extent the essence of how BCG works. In parallel with new drugs, we also have new formulations, mucoadhesive hydrogels that uh, result in a longer retention time of drug in the bladder and hence delivering more drug to the tumor, which is theoretically more effective with better outcomes. And one example of such a drug is UGN 101 from Eurogen Pharma, which has demonstrated efficacy for the local treatment of upper tract urothelial cancer. But how about wirelessly controlling drug delivery directly to bladder tumors on demand? We use 20th century industrial robots to operate on the bladder. Why not use 21st century milli robots to deliver drug into the bladder? This is possibly not tomorrow, but it quite possibly is the day after tomorrow. Uh, please watch this footage and take note of the size scale at the side of the video.
Thank you.